<laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there. Welcome to Films in Conversation, where we take a look at two pieces of media and discuss their meaning in conversation. Today we'll be discussing a little film called Punishment Park and an obscure American TV show called Breaking Bad. Just a fair warning, today's program is a bit on the serious side. It contains intense imagery and discussions of serious topics of the day. So I recommend that you pop in a Werther's original treat. By the end of the video, it'll still be hard and tasteless. Mm-mm, that's some good American manufacturing. The American desert, the Wild West, the lands outside of America, within America, a symbol of our grandest dreams, of rushing gold and overnight success, a manifestation of both the open frontier waiting to be exploited by capitalism and the barren emptiness that capitalism leaves in its wake. And no show portrays the American desert better than Breaking Bad. It feels wild to go back and watch the show now. It aired nearly a decade before the demand for free universal health care became a nationwide movement, before we had a leader whose selfish acts were hidden under the guise of caring about the little guy, before white nationalism shamelessly reemerged into the limelight, before we really had to talk about toxic fandoms and audiences stepping over boundaries. And yet, because of all these things, Breaking Bad, unfortunately, feels more relevant than ever. It's the story of a corrupt authority figure who forces his patriarchal dominance on everyone around him. It's the story of Walt's pressure on Jesse to conform in a way that benefits Walt, while he claims that everything he does is for Jesse's own good. But to talk about Breaking Bad, I first want to talk about a film that, to me, is its spiritual predecessor. Another film about the American desert. Punishment Park is a film by Peter Watkins, released in 1971. Watkins is a British filmmaker who was fearless in his attempts to dig into the cultural and political realities of his time. I mentioned Watkins before, specifically his concept of the monoform in my video on Fight Club. Watkins began his career with the pseudo-documentary film The War Game, made in 1965 as a realistic depiction of nuclear war. This little boy has received severe retinal burns from an explosion 27 miles away. It was so provocative that the BBC tried to squash the film, believing that it would scare people because it was too horrific for the medium of broadcasting, which, considering that the world was on the brink of nuclear war, was kind of the point. At the time, the supposedly independent BBC claimed that the censorship was not directed by the British government, but decades later, declassified cabinet papers revealed that BBC Director General Sir Hugh Carlton Green suggested that if the government decided to not show the film, he himself would be prepared to put out a press release to the effect that the BBC had taken the decision alone. That was exactly what did occur in November 1965. Watkins didn't let the BBC's dishonesty stop him. In fact, it only made him more resolute. In 1971, Punishment Park was Watkins' diagnosis of America. Before there was the Hunger Games, before there was Battle Royale, before Pubka, there was Punishment Park. The story is framed as a documentary with Peter Watkins behind the camera, playing a British journalist on location at El Mirage Dry Lake in California. The film takes place in an alternate 1970, although not that different from reality, in which President Nixon has declared a state of emergency over the anti-Vietnam War movement. While the events of the film are fictional, the opening quotes a real law that is still on the books in the United States, called the McCarran Internal Security Act of 1950, which authorizes federal authorities to detain persons as to whom there is reasonable ground to believe probably will engage in certain future acts of sabotage. The story follows two groups of prisoners, Group 637, who have already been tried, convicted, and sentenced to participate in the Punishment Park game, and Group 638, whose trial is just about to begin. The narrative cuts back and forth between the two groups, highlighting the hypocrisy and brutality of a militarized American justice system. In the tent, we meet Group 638, feminists, civil rights protesters, communists, draft dodgers, and artists. They are interrogated by a panel of right-wing politicians and leaders of the conservative community. If convicted, which is a given from the outset, they're offered a choice. Spend years sentenced to federal prison or three days in Punishment Park. 
A punishment park game involves trudging 53 miles through the desert on foot with no food or water pursued by police and the military. The goal? Within three days, you must reach the American flag, an ironic symbol of freedom always just out of reach across the oppressive desert wasteland. You must evade capture by the pursuing law enforcement officers and reach the flag by the appointed time. Your capture or your failure to complete the course within the given limit of time will result in the reversion to your penal sentence. Three days in the desert. Three days to evade the authorities and make it to the American flag. Three days to die in the desert, unable to ever reach that mirage of American exceptionalism and freedom. If only Walter White had admitted to himself sooner that what he was after was a mirage. Punishment Park, like Breaking Bad, feels so relevant it hurts. And we've got to either win or we've got to die. And if we do win, we're going to wreck this fucking establishment and we're going to wreck this fucking game. While the tribunals and Punishment Park are supposedly carried out in the name of justice and the betterment of American society, over the course of the film, the system's real motivations become painfully clear. To eliminate any progressive activists in American politics and violently reinforce the status quo. And as an added bonus, to provide training for the U.S. military and law enforcement personnel. Even when the prisoners play by the rules and reach the flag, they found out the hard way that the entire game is a sham. We made it. Over and over, we hear law enforcement and the committee blame the entire scenario on the prisoners. These next three days will be only as violent as you want them to be. Your capture, should that occur, will be as peaceful as you want it to be. It just it's difficult. We sit there, we try and give them a chance to have a fair say, but they just don't seem to uh, to appreciate it. You think we'd let them reach that flag? You think they deserve that flag? The tribunal is set up to arbitrarily decide who is American and who is anti-American. They don't understand what's going on in this country, the national emergency. They have no idea, no loyalty, no understanding. The authorities construct a reality that feels upside down. The people in power shift morality back and forth, a tactic that keeps their victims continually off balance. We want to hear your you message. You don't want to hear we my call, message. You spent 50 years evolving a propaganda system that'll take the truth and change it into what you want to hear. You can't come to an agreement with authority because the authority spends their time accusing you of being disagreeable. Yo, you want to go shopping? Go do it yourself, all right? I got plans. Smoking marijuana, eating Cheetos, and masturbating do not constitute plans in my book. Whatever you think is supposed to happen, the exact reverse opposite of that is going to happen. One of the cruel mind games that the tribunal plays on the prisoners in Punishment Park is promising that they'll find water along the route. This group have been told that they will find water halfway to the American flag. They promised us water at the other end. Some water faucets on. But that too is a mirage. <laughs> Try to make it to the flag. Christ, the hell are we gonna make it somewhere? We don't have no water. There's no water that way. They're just playing with your mind until they kill you. While a lack of water is a constant theme in Punishment Park, the presence of water can be just as ominous. Swimming pools are a powerful visual motif throughout Breaking Bad, a symbol of middle class America, an artificial body of water, a man made display of wealth and aspiration in an otherwise unforgiving desert. Water as blue as the meth itself. It seems like a cool relief, but just as quickly you can fall in and drown. The pool in Walt's backyard is an ever waiting pit, ready to swallow him along with his family. One of my favorite moments in this pool is when Skylar walks into the water. She decides to join Walt and help launder his money. A perverse baptism, submerging herself in crystal blue water. She chooses the mirage of a happy family, drowning any hope of saving her family from Walt. Another pool, what first seems like an oasis in Gus's flashbacks, quickly turn into a nightmare. The calm, glassy water ends up stained with the blood of Gus's partner. And it's by the same poolside years later that Gus enacts his revenge, poisoning Don Eladio, then washing his own hands of guilt in the bathroom. Over and over, when people and things plunge into the water in Breaking Bad, it's accompanied by death, either literally or figuratively. Instead of an oasis, these bodies of water are actually death traps. Breaking Bad and Punishment Park play with inverted symbolism like this constantly. Instead of life, water becomes a symbol of death. Instead of the protector, a father or figure places everyone in harm's way. Instead of resolving violence and injustice, the people in power only perpetuate violence and injustice. Yeah, Mr. White. Yes, yeah, science. 
the culmination of Jesse's arc is that final beautiful shot of Jesse screaming and crying, speeding down the road, finally free. This is the final shot of Jesse in the series because that freedom is exactly what Walter denies him throughout the series. Walt belittles and manipulates Jesse to keep Jesse under his control. If you actually this stupid. Every time Jesse tries to assert his own power or independence, Walt sabotages his chances and then places the blame back on Jesse. You left me to freak out all day long like I dropped the ball or something and you're the one who took Shut it. Shut up creating a cycle of abuse where Walt is both Jesse's only ally and the one dragging him into more and more dangerous situations. The most heartbreaking example of this is that scene that we all know very well when Walt sees Jane dying of an overdose and does nothing. Jesse was about to run away with her. He was about to leave Walt. He was about to start a new life with Jane. He'd finally found the thing that Walt always promised him, happiness. But because that relationship didn't serve Walt, because Jesse was acting of his own will instead of what best served Walt, he had to destroy it. And afterwards, Walt continually blames Jesse for her death in order to manipulate him. All right, just drop the whole concerned dad thing and tell me the truth. Just tell me you don't give a shit about me and it's either this or you'll kill me the same way you killed Mike. Just as Jesse was trying to find a way out from under Walt's control, the activists in Punishment Park are searching for an alternative to a traditionally violent and racist American society. I am not immoral, Mrs. Jurgens. You want to know what's immoral? War is immoral. Poverty is immoral. Racism is immoral. Police brutality is immoral. Despite their obvious prejudice, the Committee in Punishment Park frames themselves as the source of morality, because they can. When their public defender attempts to cite laws and precedent, his motions are summarily denied. Motion for dismissal at this time. Dismissal on what grounds? First, fourth, fifth, and fourteenth amendments. Motion overruled. Oh, you gonna overrule the Constitution? Defense, yeah. keep the defendant silent. When the prisoners do question the methods and motives of the system, these questions are deflected, ignored, or ridiculed. Who's getting killed by the guns that I hear go off? Who's dying? Who's dead? That was sitting right here. Do you know you care? Don't you dare kill me! Don't you no dare kill about me! This girl being You're a definite communist threat to this nation. You're not allowed to question the system, but the system will question young people who dare to fight against fascism, an unjust war, or a racist political power structure. The system claims to be on the side of what's good and proper, to be on the side of civilization, but the same system exercises the most brutal, violent, unjust methods imaginable. Much like how Walt always claims that what he does is for Jesse's own good, but towards the end of the show, Walt doesn't even hesitate to have Jesse killed. Good to go? At one point, the Punishment Park Committee interrogates a draft dodger, blaming him for not doing what they consider to be his civic duty. But this singular man didn't choose to go to war against Vietnam. The president and war profiteers decided to go to war under a questionable pretext. Do you know what's going on in the world today? Do you realize what's happening about the Chinese crossing the North Vietnam border and we are now bombing within five miles of the border? They expect this young person to travel to the other side of the world and put his body his life in danger to kill strangers because it serves their interests. We were just told by the senator the menace that faces us around the world, and here you sit as if this was a picnic. You got handcuffs on, and this is this is a picnic. Both Punishment Park and Breaking Bad use the imagery of people shackled in the desert, restrained and deprived of basic comforts, so that the authorities can remain safe and profit off of their suffering. Why don't you just fucking die already? Walt Jr. is one of the more under-discussed aspects of Breaking Bad, particularly the show's exploration of how our bodies are used to determine our usefulness to capitalist society. Walter continually overlooks his own son. He's the last to know that his son has chosen to go by Flynn instead of Walt Jr. Flynn? Yeah. So? He lets Flynn ruin his relationship with Skyler just so that Walt can reap his praise. You may not love him anymore, but I do. But even though Flynn continually sides with his father, Walt treats Jesse as the son he never had, the one that is able to help him pursue money and power. Flynn doesn't fit the narrow confines of what Walt thinks a able-bodied man should be. 
Walt neglects his own son and puts his life in danger, all while using the mirage of a father figure in order to keep Jesse under his wing. I mean, I'm the one who's the father here. Just as Jesse's last moments is him finally being free, Flynn's last moment is finally standing up to Walt, finally seeing that Walt's obsession with being the patriarchal figure was putting all of their lives in danger. No, what you did to mom, you asshole. You killed Uncle Hank. I don't want anything from you. The inherent ableism in patriarchy and capitalism, placing our bodies in a hierarchy depending on how much labor we're able to do, is also reflected in Hank's storyline when he falls into depression, no longer able to walk. Or when Skylar is pregnant and Walt uses her body as an excuse to make even more dangerous decisions while telling himself that he's acting out of concern for their daughter. Or when Gus's partner is executed. Gus being gay is seen as a mark against his manliness, something that must be pruned or trimmed by his business partners in order to be considered more of a man. Our bodies are the final frontier of control. Get a big old raging heart on at the idea of catching this piece of shit. Hank's obsession with chasing death is a fascinating contrast to Walt's. Walt is trying to run from his inevitable fate death from cancer. He's a ticking clock. On the other hand, Hank continually puts himself in deadly situations. At times, we want to grab him by the shoulders and shout, why the hell are you acting like this, Hank? But we know exactly why he's acting this way, don't we? Even when he's at his most irrational. Because we know he's always acting how he thinks a man is supposed to act. In Walter's twisted view of masculinity, a man's number one role is to provide for his family, even if that means putting that same family in danger. A man provides. And he does it even when he's not appreciated, or respected, or even loved. He simply bears up, and he does it. To Hank, a man like him is supposed to uphold the law, even if that means breaking the law. He continually disobeys his superiors by going on stakeouts outside of the scope of his work. He acts as judge and jury, carrying out what he believes to be justice. We see this most directly when he assaults Jesse in his own home, out of pure rage and selfishness. After the cousins ambush Hank, he no longer has his job to give him a sense of meaning and masculinity. And as a result, Hank feels useless. He's trapped in a domestic setting and he dives into buying and studying rocks. The rocks are a symbol of his own hardness, his unwillingness and inability to express his own pain. Hank is immobile, no longer able to venture out into the wild chasing bad guys, so he brings these symbols of the wild into his home, filling his life with them. Whether as a DEA agent or as a bedridden victim of violence, Hank isn't able to find happiness with his partner Marie, or happiness with his extended family, or happiness at all. He's obsessed with pursuing death as a means of doling out righteous punishment. And when he fails that, he becomes obsessed with collecting lifeless objects. He always had trouble relating to other humans, constantly making awkward racist jokes. He refuses to talk about his feelings, refuses therapy, refuses to confront his trauma. Even after a miraculous recovery, he dies back into his violent career. Of course, this time, his fate is final. He's killed and buried out in the desert. Hank has become a part of the very wasteland that obsessed him, his body among the rocks and sand, erased by the desert. In Punishment Park, the cops behave similarly to Hank, obsessed with their role as enforcers, as unquestionably right. They seem to believe that they're incapable of being wrong, acting as judge, jury, and executioner. Uh, I think he's in for some real, real bad stuff. I don't have a heart of him. He's got one for everybody. He's got one for the world. So fuck him. If that's the way he wants to play, that's the way we'll play. When the prisoners are able to fight back for their freedom and ambush a cop, they use this self-defense as an excuse to escalate their tactics and violence. There's no doubt about the fact that it will cause more antagonism, and I think antagonism is a very mild word on the part of the men in my command toward these individuals. It doesn't matter that the prisoners were fighting back in an unfair, unconstitutional, unwinnable game. Are you expecting to die in the next two or three days? I expect to die in the next two or three minutes. It doesn't matter that they were defending themselves from an enemy that they knew was trying to kill them from the start. People are just being just killed for nothing, hauled off to jail, hauled off to prison. I mean, the feeling is there is no feeling. Have you ever killed a man yourself? Yes, I have. What did you feel about that at the time? There was no feeling at all. 
where Hank was willing to go outside the scope of his position and disobey his superiors. In Punishment Park, the idea that the law enforcement officers and soldiers will act outside the limits of their assigned roles seemed like a given from the start. They made their choice. They made their choice. They could have done a lot of things, but they chose to, like, uh, conspire to violently overthrow the government. Fine, that's their choice. They're doing what they want to do. I'm doing what I want to do. In the desert, there is no oversight. No one to argue for due process or civil rights. During a lunch break, the camera crew films the tribunal members breaking bread with the cops and military. It connects the violence of the law enforcement with their political counterparts, who give them the justification for their violence. The cops may be the enforcer of this perverted justice, but it's by the whims of the council that they are able to carry it out. Gus is an upstanding member of society and regularly lectures about providing for one's family, about supporting the community. Is this some sort of message? I'm supporting my community. He offers a reward for information on Hank's shooting. He even brings fried chicken to the cops, casually eating and hanging out with them, just like the tribunal hanging out with the cops in Punishment Park. When Gus tells Murray, Men like your husband are the thin blue line between us and these animals. We can imagine the tribunal making the exact same declaration about the cops in Punishment Park. It's a very difficult job to do, it really is. But somebody has to do it, you know. We do our best. And all the while, we know that despite Gus's highly civilized words, you keep the peace. Yeah, we'll keep the peace. Shake hands. He is as responsible for violence as anyone else, just as the tribunal is as responsible for the violence in Punishment Park as anyone else. It's a violent, hypocritical authority that wants you to do as they say, not as they do. And that's one of the most brilliant aspects of both Punishment Park and Breaking Bad, the way they complicate our traditional understanding of good and evil, of cop and crook. At another time, the honorable thing or the right thing to do might be to be a policeman or to be president. Right now, I think the honorable thing to do is to be a criminal. Both works present us with the painful, complicated realities of modern life, then show us how people in power brush past those realities, substituting them with feel-good fairy tale narratives that only serve the people in power. There are more color television sets and automobiles owned by black people in the United States and all of Russia together. So what? I did it for me. I liked it. While Hank's character kept trying and failing to fit into the confines of a particular definition of masculinity, the actress Anna Gunn was harassed because her character Skylar didn't fit within the confines of a particular definition of femininity. The loyal mob wife. I fucked Ted. Anna Gunn was playing a character, and yet people had the audacity to put her on trial to send her death threats because she deviated from conventional tropes that they could easily digest. They just wanted the wife to sit by her husband's side. It's so hard to rewatch the show and not side with Skylar. Every time she notices danger or sees through Walt's lies, her worries are confirmed. She's right. Walt is woefully inept at being a drug kingpin. Just as the prisoners in Punishment Park chase the mirage of the American flag, Walt chases the mirage of the immortal Heisenberg. Even the show itself has become a kind of mirage, its meaning clouded by consumerism. For years after Breaking Bad ended, you could buy a Heisenberg t-shirt at Kohl's, a product of the same dehumanizing capitalist system that this show was trying to criticize. For every seemingly badass, I am the one who knocks moment, there are countless examples of Walt being cruel for cruelty's sake. And this is one way that Punishment Park pushes its message harder than Breaking Bad. Punishment Park can be hard to watch because it deals with repression and political violence in such a blunt way. Looking back 50 years and seeing that we're dealing with the exact same issues the activists were dealing with in Punishment Park can make it feel like we're on some sort of hamster wheel, running as fast as we can, but not getting any closer to that symbol of freedom. But at the same time, watching this movie can be comforting in a way. People have always been able to cut through the propaganda and see the American justice system for what it is. And unlike Breaking Bad, which comes from a fairly narrow point of view, that of a patriarchal white male father figure, Punishment Park offers a lot more diversity of opinion. The structure of Punishment Park makes it much, much harder to misinterpret. 
A big reason for this is that Watkins saw one of his earlier films, Culloden, as a failure, and tried to correct those mistakes with his later films. Culloden tackled important issues about war and societal privilege, but Watkins addressed the film's shortcomings when he said, Although the film does affect us all, and I think all of us can see ourselves in the faces of those people at the time, I think there's a mental loophole so that you can also say that you don't. It just sits at that edge of the definition where a white middle-class liberal, and in fact a broader area even than that, can sort of indulge in the cathartic exercise of looking at something, getting a kick out of it, washing his guilt off, and then getting on with the dishes afterwards. And many like to point out that, similarly, Better Call Saul also does a better job at tackling the same themes found in Breaking Bad. So when we watch a politically charged film like Punishment Park or a culturally relevant TV show like Breaking Bad, as an audience, we have to ask ourselves, do we learn something from it and use that knowledge to affect change in the real world? Or do we just binge it and when the screen goes dark, get on with doing the dishes? Oh, Werther's, you never leave me. Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you'd like to support the channel so that I can make more videos like this, you could become a patron like these kind people. Just head on over to patreon.com slash Mayfish. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. And for the time being, please continue to save Martha. Now, if you'll excuse me. Thank you.